station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston station is ready for the event. Alamo Heights, no, Alamo Heights High School. This is Mission Control. Please call station for a voice check. <clears throat> Are you ready for me? Okay. Ready for me? Okay. Uh, station, this is Congressman Lamar Smith at Alamo Heights High School in San Antonio, Texas. Um, how do you hear me? Uh, Representative Smith, uh, we hear you loud and clear. How are you today, sir? Uh, doing wonderfully well, thanks to you all. Uh, I hope you can hear that applause in the background. 130 students are looking forward to hearing what you had to say. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. I just was saying you are the heroes of the day, so thank you for, uh, uh, for sharing your time and your expertise. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Mr. Lang, who is their teacher, and then we'll get to the questions. But thanks again for everything. Thank you, sir. Tamara, you're first, and then um, uh, after that will be Sarah and Eric and Josh, so you guys, or uh, Jacob, so let's get you guys up here first, okay? You might as well go first. Go ahead. Just go first, yeah. Um, hi, first question. Um, I was wondering, uh, because the station is uh, underneath uh, the roach limit, do, is there any tidal stress or, or stretching on the frame of the station? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a very interesting question, and I have to admit I had to look up uh, what the roach limit is. And to be honest, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but it does highlight a, a very important point, and that is that the space station itself is a very complex machine, and it's taken thousands of people uh, to build it and to run it and to make it work. And there are, there are experts on, on every system out there. So, you know, I'm guessing that there's probably someone out there that's very familiar with that limit and uh, they could probably answer it for you. But unfortunately, uh, yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, Rick and I uh, aren't able to answer that one. Hi, I'm Eric. And I was wondering, um, did you guys plan to be an astronaut like from childhood or did you come to it through a class you took in high school or college? You know, I was always interested in math and science when I was uh, probably starting in fourth or fifth grade, and I was interested all through high school on that. But I never really thought that I could be an astronaut. I never even knew that I could be an astronaut, to tell you the truth, till I was about 27 years old. And I saw an advertisement in a magazine, at that, and they were looking for uh, astronauts, and people could fill out applications. And this is when the space shuttle program was just beginning. So uh, that opened my eyes and made me understand that anybody can be an astronaut. It all it takes is a lot of hard work and a lot of dedication. Um, I'm Tamara, and I was wondering if, if your height has changed since you've been on the ISS. So, yeah, yeah you can see Rick growing right now as we speak. Um, yeah, you know, we do end up growing because when you, you get into the microgravity environment, uh, you you offload your spine, and so there is a little bit of growth, but that uh, we try and, and actually minimize that through uh, through exercise and things like that, so we're constantly loading up our body as well. And so in reality, my stature has only probably changed about 3%, so not as much as I was hoping. I was hoping to hit six feet, but uh, I don't think I've got there. Uh, I'm Sarah, and I was wondering how you prevent the loss of bone density since you're not putting weight on your legs. Hi, Sarah. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, like Mike said, we exercise quite a bit. So the types of exercise we have is we run on a treadmill. And the way we run on the treadmill is we wear a harness and it kind of in bungees strap us to the treadmill. So that puts a lot of load on our shoulders and on our legs. And that helps with what you're talking about. It puts load on our muscles and on our bones. And then we also lift a lot of weights. We have a pneumatic system. 
that allows us to, uh, it's basically a resistive exercise device, if you will. And that also, it's basically squats and deadlifts and bench pressing and things like that. And again, that puts load on our muscles, which helps our bone density. And of course, a, a good diet and this uh, constant exercise two hours every day helps to minimize the loss of uh, bone density while we're up here. Hi, I'm Zoe, and I have a question for Rick. Um, has being able to view the world from the ISS changed your perspective on world politics or affairs or anything? Hey, Zoe, yeah, that's a, uh, that's a good question. I don't really pay too much attention to world politics, but I do obviously read the news, and I understand all the problems that are going on in the world today. And it does change your view being up here a little bit because uh, you look at the world so much differently. The world is, uh, is, is an incredibly beautiful place, but it's also, a, it seems like a much smaller place. As we go through training over the three years, we visit a lot of different countries. I spent a lot of time in Russia, in Japan, in Germany, even some time in Canada, and of course, uh, lots of time in Houston in my home, my home city. So the world becomes a much smaller place when you go through this experience and you get more familiar with the different locations and things don't seem as foreign anymore to you. Uh, so, yeah, you do change a little bit and you start to think that uh, maybe uh, it would be better if people just got along, of course. Hi, I'm Anne. My question is for Mike. And how many of hours do you, of sleep do you get and is it restful or stressful? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And actually, I found uh, up here I'm sleeping about as much as I do when I'm on the ground. And that's uh, somewhere between five or six hours of, of sleep every night. I get up pretty much at the same time and, and tend to go to bed at the same time. As far as stressful, sleep is never stressful. Um, so it's, it's actually pretty relaxing. Of course, it's a little bit different up here. We, we sleep in sleeping bags. And because there's no up or down, we can just tie the sleeping bag to a wall, to the deck, to the, to the overhead, wherever is, uh, however our, our crew quarters are laid out. Um, so you crawl in that sleeping bag, and you kind of wrap yourself up, and it's actually pretty comfortable. Hi, I'm Ayin. My question is for Rick. How is this space food, and have there, any, have there ever been any attempts to grow food on board? Oh, the food. Yeah. Hey, we, we have all kinds of food up here. We have a pretty wide selection of food. And it comes in basically uh, three different forms. We have the irradiated food that's kind of like, uh, like the, you find in an MRE that the military folks eat. We have the uh, dehydrated food that basically, this is, uh, this is actually uh, rice pudding. It's hard as a rock right now, but we add some water to it, and it uh, goes back to its normal state, and it's actually pretty good. And then, of course, we have our drink bags. It's really not much more than an envelope with some powder in it. This is pineapple drink. We add water, shake it up, and we got a good pineapple drink. Uh, as far as food, growing food, Mike is, uh, Mike is making an attempt to grow, uh, I think this is a pumpkin seed that he brought up, and this is kind of his, uh, his hobby. He grows these little seedlings and they're try trying to get them as, uh, as big as, as he can, but uh, it's going to be a while before we actually get fruit out of them, I think. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Luther and my question is for Mike. Uh, what are the living conditions like on the ISS? Is it cramped or do you have personal space? Yeah, actually, the, the International Space Station is quite large. It's probably about the size of uh, the inside of a Boeing 747, or I've heard it described as a, a five-bedroom house. So there's, there's quite a bit of space, on, uh, space in it. Uh, we do have a little bit of uh, private space. Uh, we each have a crew quarter uh, where we sleep and where we are able to, uh, we have our own computers in there so we can communicate with our families and friends from, from that location. And it's about the size of a small broom closet, or for anyone that uh, is familiar with a phone booth, that's about the size of it. So you do have a, you do have a, a, a small bit of private space, but overall, you know, you don't really notice it. It's big enough that as we're working throughout the day, you know, we don't, we can go hours without seeing each other. As as you're working in one module and your crewmates are working in a different one, so it, it's pretty comfortable. And my question's for Rick. This has sort of already been asked, but can you tell us a little bit more about how difficult it is to maintain your physical fitness in space? 
Yeah, it's actually, uh, it is difficult in that it's, uh, it's very time consuming. Uh, again, like I said, we spend about two, two and a half hours a day working out. Uh, a little more than an hour, almost an hour and a half lifting weights or in on, the, on a resistive exercise device. And then I kind of alternate. Some days I'll run on a treadmill and then some days I'll exercise on a, a, a stationary bicycle that we have here. And that's usually probably about 40 minutes or so. So it, it's the biggest problem is, is that it's time consuming. And it takes up a lot of time for the crew member, takes time away from science and research. So some of the things we're trying to do is figure out more efficient ways for the crew member to exercise or try to minimize how much exercise the crew member needs and, of course, still stay healthy so that he could have more time to uh, do science and research. Rick. Uh, how big of a problem is carbon dioxide buildup and are there spots on the ISS with poor ventilation where carbon dioxide is a problem? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, carbon dioxide, it's, um, it's not a real big problem up here because we have, uh, like you say, we have quite a bit, quite a number of fans. You know, we got intermodule ven ventilation, we got ventilation between the modules, we got ventilation for basically everything up here. So it obviously mixes the air and keeps carbon dioxide from building up. I remember on one of my first missions in, in 2000 when the space station was only about three different segments, the ventilation system wasn't fully worked out, it wasn't fully installed yet because we were just still building the space station. And as you can see, these racks up here, sometimes we would be working behind these racks, and if you're back there for a long period of time, you'd get these CO2 pockets would build up as you're back there breathing. And, you know, the, the symptom is you end up with a headache. So it's nothing, nothing, usually nothing worse than you just end up with a headache, and you kind of wonder, why do I have a headache? Well, because CO2 built up where you are. But uh, that not really much of a problem. Since I've been up here the past uh, uh, three months now, uh, I've had very few CO2 symptoms. So it's, uh, I think it's a problem that we've uh, solved. Hi, my name is Eric Castellon. My question is for Mike. What dangers do solar winds and space junk pose on the ISS? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I didn't quite catch it. This question is for Mike. Uh, what dangers do solar winds and space junk pose on the ISS? Okay, yeah, that's, that's a great question, and primarily the, the uh, space junk is what causes the most danger for us. In fact, the Air Force actually tracks all of these objects in space, thousands of objects in space, and uh, they predict where in their, those objects are going to be in their orbits, and then they're also looking at where the space station is in its orbit, and if it looks like any of those are going to meet, then they'll get in touch with NASA, and we, if, uh, if it looks um, um, likely that that's going to happen, then we might actually move the station. And so that means changing its orbit a little bit, boosting it up. And if, uh, if there's not enough time to do that, however, then we might actually have to go down to our Soyuz vehicle, which is uh, what we would use to come home in, uh, just in case there is any kind of a strike like that and we needed to get away, we would be ready to do so. Hey, I'm Andrew. Uh, this question's for Mike. Uh, do you have any uh, recreational time, and if so, uh, what do you do for fun? Yeah, so you, you saw some of the things I like to do uh, during our free time, and we do have some free time. Um, our days are pretty full. We get a few hours each night, and then uh, typically on the weekends, we'll have a little bit of extra time there for, for recreational. So, you know, I've been playing around with trying to get some seeds to grow. That's been pretty tough, but one of the one of the things that's the most fun is just floating. I mean, it's it's a fantastic experience. I, I love doing it. I love doing it as I work. Um, and uh, so you never get tired of that. Looking out the window and, and taking pictures of the earth is, is a bunch of fun as well. And then we do a lot of the same things that you guys do. Occasionally we watch movies. Um, I like to read books. So uh, every night before I go to bed, I'm typically reading a book as well. And then we spend a lot of time as well calling uh, friends and family.
Oh, sorry. Um, do you feel that the training you received on the simulators prepared you for your mission, or is that something that you can't simulate on Earth? Oh, yeah, the training uh, prepares us very well. Like I said before, the training, we trained, I think, about uh, two and a half to three years for this mission. And it was quite extensive, and we trained a lot, spent a lot of time in Russia, Japan, uh, Germany, and Canada because it is an international partnership, and we train each other in, on each other's astronauts in, uh, in the various facilities. Uh, the training is is often the training is kind of just in case training, just in case we have a malfunction of some kind, we have to be prepared to react to that malfunction and try to get the space station back uh, back to its normal configuration. That's a lot of our training and uh, it prepares us very well. Actually, I'd just like to add, though, that one thing the simulator can't give for you, though, is if you have a rack up here that you need to work on, when we're down on the Earth, we can't do this. Well, you can, but it's just a lot harder. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you. My name is Jordan Supase, and I have a question for Mike. Um, What's the most difficult part of living in space? Yeah, you know, that's, uh, that's a hard question to answer because it's, it's fantastic living in space. Um, probably the hardest part is being away from your family. Um, that's never easy, no matter if you're on the Earth or up here in, in space. But um, I'm actually going to steal some words from Rick uh, that he's used to describe uh, like what it's like going outside on an EVA. A lot of times, the, the simple things on Earth become difficult up here. Um, the little things like just eating your food. You saw how we have to eat up here out of little packets. And, and so when you're just eating your food and, and you spill something, it ends up just going everywhere because it's flowing and it doesn't just fall down to the ground. Um, so a lot of those little things become a little bit more, or easy things become more difficult up in space. And sometimes, uh, as Rick says too, the impossible things become pretty easy. So these racks that weigh hundreds, hundreds of pounds that we would never be able to move on our own uh, down on Earth, we're able to do up here in space quite easily. So uh, it's, it's absolutely fantastic up here. And uh, really, there's not, there's not too much that's uh, extremely difficult. Hi, my name is Nicole, and this question is for Rick. Could you describe the experience of takeoff and reentry? Yeah, launch is uh, an incredibly dynamic event, is the words I usually use. Uh, you know, you're sitting on the launch pad, everything is usually very quiet, and then at launch, it's basically, it's, uh, it's kind of like accelerating very quickly in an amusement park ride or a, or a car, I guess, if you will. And it's also a lot of vibrations, a lot of noise, and the, I flew both on the space shuttle now and on the Soyuz rocket, and the, one of the things, uh, the space shuttle jumps off the launch pad a lot quicker, but the Soyuz rocket is very dynamic during staging in that when one stage burns out, you kind of get thrown forward in your seat, and then when the, second, the next stage lights, you get thrown back in your seat, and then again, the vibrations pick up. So it's a very dynamic time. There's a... Uh, uh, on the Soyuz vehicle, there's not very good windows to look out, but on the space shuttle, it was a great view as we used to fly up the East Coast. So I used to be able to look out the window and see the whole, basically the whole East Coast, so it was a fantastic view. And the entry on the shuttle, I only have that experience at this point, was uh, not much different than uh, flying in an airplane, because you're more in an airplane configuration. Uh, and it was kind of interesting because you would start out weightless and then the, the lower and lower you got, or slower and slower you got, the gravity would kind of slowly pull you into your seat so you just felt heavier and heavier and heavier until you landed and then you felt very, very heavy because you're in a one gravity or one G field for the first time in several weeks. Hello, my name is Ted and my question's for Mike. What takes place in the event of a medical emergency that may require hospital care? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So we actually have uh, quite a bit of medical equipment on board the, the space station uh, for just about any, any contingency. And we all have to go through quite a bit of training on being a medical officer up here. Uh, now, we're very fortunate in that our commander, Oleg Kotov, a uh, Russian cosmonaut, he's also a doctor. And so it's certainly nice when you, when you do have a doctor on board uh, so that if there is that kind of an emergency, uh, he's here to help out. But on the other hand, if there's not, we have doctors on the ground as well, and they're there ready to help us out. So if, if someone gets seriously injured, what we're going to do is we're going to work together with that doctor on the ground to try and uh, figure out what's the best course of treatment for the person that's injured. We've come to the end of our questions and the end of our wonderful program with Rick and Mike. Uh, first of all, let's give them a really rousing round of applause. Rick and Mike, thank you all again. Uh, as I said earlier, you're really the heroes of, of the modern era. Uh, we thank you for your sacrifices. We thank you for your expertise and for your courage as well. Uh, you've inspired a lot of us today. And I said uh, uh, earlier as well, maybe there's an astronaut in the audience, a future astronaut in the audience. We'll find out. But thank you again and wish you well and a safe trip back in March when you come back to Earth. Well, thank you very much. It was absolutely fantastic. We enjoyed spending some time with you. They, they can't see us. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Lamar Smith and Alamo Heights High School. Station, we are now resuming operational audio, audio communications.